Shirley Horn was one of the many artists that performed at the New Thing Jazz Workshop at uh, St. Margaret's Church over on Connecticut Avenue. But the New Thing was actually located on 18th Street. They had a storefront and a workshop and uh, a, a townhouse and other other locations. And it was founded and directed by Topper Carew. And Topper's on the line right now. Topper, welcome to WPFW. Hey, man. It's it's uh, really good to hear your voice. <laughs> and it's, it's great to hear Shirley's voice. Oh, man. absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, so so uh, here it is over, God, 54, 55 years that we've known each other and uh, yeah. responsible for a radio show that I did in the 1970s, the New Thing Root Music Show, and responsible for uh, my meeting the, the, the woman I've been married to two for 54 years so it's, it's, <laughs> the new thing has been a very important part of my life but but tell us about it and how, how it got started and what was the what was the impetus for, for the name the new thing art and architecture center it was, well you know i was an architect so that part's easy and uh, you know uh i opened a a little storefront on Florida Avenue that coincidentally I rented from Lloyd McNeil. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so that was going to be the place where I became like the people's architect, man, because I'd been in the South, you know, with, with, with uh, the student on violent coordinating committee. Mm -hmm. And that changed my whole thing, man. You know, from, from that point on, I wanted to be like a, a, a service person. And so kids used to peek in the door and they were saying, well, who, who is this Who is this brother? You know, that brother being me with the long hair and the beard right. and, and mm -hmm. all. And so uh, uh, Lloyd and I got together, and Lloyd became a, an art teacher in the afternoon after school, and, we, and I became an architectural practice, you know, in the morning. So that's how we got the name Art. And then we couldn't really figure out the name, so we figured, well, we'll just call it the new thing. Uh -huh. And that was the expression for, for the music, the, the, the music that John Coltrane and Ornette Coleman and Cecil Taylor were doing at that time in the 60s. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Mm. wow. And you know, the, mm. the, the, the whole music thing that we did at St. Margaret's Church was an idea that uh, Lloyd and I cooked up, and he was, you know, the original curator, man. He would He would bring the groups in, and he was one of the original groups who who played, you know, at the New Thing Jazz Workshop at St. Margaret's, and that thing just blossomed, man. You know, and, and the idea behind it was, let's let's try to create a platform for the, for the jazz musicians and other musicians in D.C. where they would be taken seriously. There was no alcohol, it was, you know, coffee and tea, and it it was a, a dollar to get in, man. Oh, right. Right. One dollar. And, and if you remember, we had this legendary doorman named Mr. Rhythm. Right. Oh, of course. The tap dancing rhythm. <laughs> right. Tap Mr. Rhythm. rhythm Absolutely. Boy. Yeah. So it was, it was a high spirited place, man. And, you know, it was just about trying to make, you know, give a home to, to music and, and have the musicians come in and play some of their original work. And, and you know, not have to you know to 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 find their way through the club scene, man, which wasn't very big in D.C. at the time, anyway. But it was a platform for musicians, man, to really reveal themselves and reveal their creativity. Well, you know, the, Andrew White, uh, his first album on Andrew's music was live at the New Thing. <clears throat> yeah, mm. yeah, and you know. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew was a monster, man. Andrew oh, was playing. Bates with Stevie Wonder. <clears throat> Chris Obo with with the American Ballet and leading his own group on tenor and alto. I mean, I know. That's, it's just it's phenomenal amazing. and connected yeah. with the new thing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so how did you get the, the 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 classes? I mean, you had a drumming class that was taught by Eric Ravat, who who went on to mm -hmm. to play with McCoy Tyner and Weather Report. How how did that connection get made? Well, yeah, you know, um, Howard University was a very, very important part of the new thing. And so Lloyd was was uh, Howard. Uh, <laughs> Eric Gavard was mm -hmm. Howard. You know, um, Angel White was Howard. 
the the uh, new thing quartet quintet rather that eventually became the Blackbirds was Howard. So you know Howard University, man. You know, and I was a Howard person sure. in the architecture school. Mm-hmm. I would leave Howard, man, and I'd go and get what I refer to as master teachers. You know, who would get you know high school kids and some of the college kids to be their apprentices, and then they would teach the kids. But that's how we recruited. It was basically, you know, a, a very strong Howard contingent of people who became the teachers at the new thing. Well, Sandy Barrett was part of Melvin Deal's African Heritage Dancers and Drummers, and she was also at Howard at that time. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and I have such strong memories of Sandy. Wow. Well. You know, you know, it, and and uh, and the the two of you, and but you know, uh, we were, you know, it, it was so interesting. Melvin, Melvin was a, was a master, and you know that was the soundtrack of 18th Street. You would hear as soon as you got onto 18th Street, you would hear those drums, man. That you know, that was that was the soundtrack, and and. Uh, you know, Melvin, of course, went on with African heritage and, and made a great mark for himself in D.C. But um, Melvin and, let me see, uh, Barnett Williams. And, oh, yes, Barnett. Yeah, Barnett went with Gil Scott. And a couple of other drummers from Melvin's troop went with Gil Scott Heron, man. And, and uh, you know, uh, I would say the Probably the strongest drum circle in D.C. was at the New York. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. How did the uh, photography workshop get started? Well, that that's that that's interesting, you know, because at the New Thing, we uh, you know made ourselves available for people who wanted to do alternative service rather than go to Vietnam. So. This, this young dude named Tom Zetterstrom showed up wanting to do alternative service with us. He was a photographer, and he started the whole photography workshop. Awesome. I mean, so the kids all had cameras to work with? and uh, we, got just... cam- we got cameras for the kids, and then we made them and, you know, our young teens photographers. And they became masterful, uh, masterful photographers. And we did the same thing in filmmaking. You know, we had a young crew of, of, of uh, teens, young teens making films, you know. Uh, and it became a, a very important way for them to express themselves because, you know, some of them may not have been great students, but they, were, but they became very good filmmakers. And they had great ideas that they brought to film and, and, and in fact, you know, there's there's a show coming up um, at the American University Museum that uh, will feature the new thing because they've a bunch of the photographs have been found by photographers who were there. Tom being one, the other being uh, uh, Joel Jacobson, who introduced the idea of photography to the new thing and introduced the idea of of filmmaking to the new thing. Well, he was a very good friend of Lloyd McNeil's. And, you know, Lloyd was central to so much of what we did because with the uh, New Thing Jazz Workshops, we produced an original art poster every week. It was him, you know, doing the design, and Lou Stalvall doing the, the silk screen applications. And those, those posters from the New Thing Jazz Workshop that we gave away every week have become... Serious collectors. Oh, there was an incredible show at the Phillips uh, collection of Lou Stovall and Lloyd McNeil's artwork with all those posters. Oh that, yeah, you know, and uh, I, I have, I still have some in my house. Also, the posters are really classic. Oh yeah, you know? definitely, definitely classic, man. And and uh, there's another uh, show coming up at the, at the Smithsonian sometime in March to talk about, you know, how the 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 new thing influenced the whole art scene in D.C. because I remember when I when it, I first started, the D.C. Commission of the Arts was all white, man, mm. and I challenged wow. that because <laughs> because mm-hmm. here we were in a city that was like eighty percent black, and you didn't have anybody uh, black on the D.C. Art Commission, man. So I changed that. 
<laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, boy. So uh, we have. Uh, uh, well, actually, uh, after the new thing, you went on to to do film. You went out to Hollywood for a while, and uh, you, you did did a classic recording called DC Cab. How did that all come about? You know, um, I went to uh, L.A. and I wanted to to affect change in L.A. Because L.A. had the same problem that D.C. had. It was, you know, you know, there's probably two or three black producers out there. So I went out there to change that, man. And, you know, uh, I was introduced to Universal Studios by a friend of mine uh, back east. And uh, they originally wanted me to do a, a, a film about Soul Train. But, uh, you know, and... and, and they had seen a film, by the way, that I had done, uh, that I had produced. It was a film called uh, This is the Home of Mrs. Lamont Graham. And the guy who was the head of production on the theatrical film side at Universal said that that was a, one of the teaching films that he had seen when he went to the film school at the uh, University of, of North Carolina. And so he remembered me and invited me in and said, listen, I want you to make uh, this film about Soul Train, Cornelius didn't want to do it. Uh huh. Okay. So okay. So <laughs> they then said to me, "Well, listen, what do you want to do?" Yeah. I said, "Well, I want to do a a film about DC, and you know, so what we going to what kind of film are we going to make about DC?" I said, "Let's do a film about a black cab company." All right, but I I made it a a multicultural cab company. Let's do a film about that. That's an underdog company. That's you know that a, a big time cab company is trying to knock off, and that became the basis of the whole project, and and the rest uh, is on is is history, man. That you know it was about a group of multicultural underdogs, man. I, I think yeah. I, I skipped over to get to, to Hollywood uh, when you did the the public TV uh, uh, programming also uh, along the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, oh yeah, Righteous oh, Apples yeah. was the name of it. Yeah, I did. I did a uh, a series for public television. It was the first domestically <clears throat> produced sitcom on public television. It was called The Righteous Apples. It was about busing in Boston. Believe it or not, it was about a group of multicultural kids who had been bused, but who decided that they loved music so much that they wanted to be a band, and that band was called The Righteous Apples. Mm -mm. But you, after this sojourn out west, you're back in in the Boston area now. What have you been doing up there? Well, I'll tell you what I've been doing up here. I've, I've been at uh, the MIT Media Lab, and so I created a uh, a whole enterprise for Google called Code Next, which uh, you know brings young people into the uh, coding area and into the fabrication area, and and uh, so that you know. They're, they're in the game. And then um, uh, I was still making films. I made a, a, a number of, of films against gun violence, which uh, have helped a, a couple of organizations up here raise over a million dollars, you know, for their, their anti-violence work. And then um, at GBH, when I went there to WGBH, I became one of the program managers and I produced the, the uh, a, a national series called Rebop. Um, I produced a, a, a national series called Say Brother and a local series called Say Brother, and I became one of the program managers. Which was, oh, and those are the we were the three people who were responsible for all of the production that came out of the GBH. But I was limited to doing documentary and, and uh, narrative work, so I wanted to. I was inspired by Norman Lear and All in the Family, you know, and and so I I, I finally tricked my way to Los Angeles and uh, got out there, met Lear, got out there, met Universal, and next thing I knew, I had relationships with them, and I started producing films, uh, you know, that got to HBO, Showtime, ABC, CBS, you know, you know all 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 of those players, and and that's how I came upon DC Cab. Then I hung out in LA, and then finally 
I produced this show called Martin, the Martin Lawrence Show. Oh, okay, you're right. You were connected that's, with that. That's been on 33 years, man. Wow. You know, and, you know, I, if I go into a black barber shop and I say it, I did the Martin show, man. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's a cascade of jokes, or either it'll be somebody who tells me I was having a bad day. I went home and watched a couple of episodes of Martin, and then my, then my, then I got a lift. And so that, that was that's that's been the most interesting uh, aspect of the show, you know, because you know it it resonates so strongly in terms of you know that relationship between him and, and, you know, and Tisha, you know, he being the knucklehead, you know, she being that beautiful black woman, you know, smart. And at the end of every week, you know, even though they might have a beef, they come back together and they're in love. So that's, so I wanted to do that, a show like that, you know, that was, you know, showed how, you know, a couple could be together, you know, even if they were having, some rough times, you know, it always smoothed out that by the end of every episode, they were still in love. Oh, absolutely. I want to go back a bit because you were one of the first interviews, <clears throat> excuse me, that I had on, on WGTB, mm. you know, and mm. uh, it, it seemed that that put a spark in your mind about uh, uh, having a show for the new thing. And somehow in 1969, July of 1969, the new thing, Root Music Show, came on the air on WAMU, the American University Station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you carry that on, man. You know, so how, how did you make that connection? How did that happen? Well, you know, the love of music, man. You know, it, it's always been in, in my spirit. It's in my DNA. You know, there, there isn't a day that I don't listen to music. You know, music is like oxygen. You know, so... Um, you know, I think I had a friend over there who was a dean or a vice president. And I said, you know what? You know, we, we, we're doing the, the, the new thing, jazz workshop, and we would like to, to do something that propagates the music and talks about, you know, the root of the music. And uh, so next thing I know, we have, uh, we had a radio show. And, and you know, uh, it, it, you continued that. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, well, I appreciate having the opportunity to do it also. So let's bring us to to American University coming up uh, from February 7th to March 17th at American University, the uh, the, the photography show. Tell us about that. What, what will be happening? Yeah, so uh, Joel Jacobson and I did a book back in the late 60s, a book of photographs. And it was a hardcover bound, and we did it as part of our uh, a presentation to raise money. Uh, and I think that particular uh, proposal went to the National Endowment of the Arts. Well, here's, you know, here's the thing. When, when I would do proposals, you know, you know, most proposals were just a stack of Xerox papers, and they were 8.5 by 11. Well, I, I figured, well, let me do my proposals and let them be 11 by 14 and let them stand out of the, so they stick out of, uh, out of the stack and, and let me do them artfully. So we always did these very artful presentations and proposals. And one of them was this book of photographs that had been sitting in a closet and, um, um, you know, somebody who was a friend of, of, uh, of, of Joel's, you know, decided that, hey, we should do, we should maybe do a show around these. And then um, uh, Tom Zetterstrom, who had been doing photographs, um, you know, the same, same thing. And, and uh, on the basis of that, you know, a, sh a show evolved. And, you know, the, the kids at Wilson High School, you know, very, very significant to to uh, uh, to this, and you know, it's it's a uh, that's that's how the show came. So uh, that's how the show right. Came to be. So so uh, Wilson High School is now Jackson Reed High School, and students are involved in in this presentation. That's that's mm -hmm. that's bringing mm -hmm. this connection around. So there's a 
opening uh, reception on on February tenth, from oh, s- from okay. six until eight. I, I see, <laughs> and uh, and the night before though is the film showing at the AFI Silver Theater, and, and uh, what, what's this this new documentary that you've done on the new thing? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short one, but tell us about it. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's a very important documentary because, you know, I'm making a new film that's making me look back, and um, the I had I had forgotten, quite honestly, how much the new thing had done and had accomplished. I mean, all the way from, uh, you know, uh, designing. Uh, a, a, a crew that I put together designing Resurrection City for for Dr. King and the Poor People's Campaign to over 200 jazz workshops into a whole series of films that we made uh, to a whole spectrum of political activity that we were involved in, you know, winning design awards, art director's awards, film awards. I've forgotten all that stuff, man. You know, and, you know... Uh, you know, and and one person who is very important to this is a brother named Mark Minsker, who is at, you know, the old Wilson High School, mm-hmm. who has been, you know, a very critical organizer to this whole endeavor. And his energy and his passion, I think, are very, very instrumental in making all of this happen. Well, he he was the friend of... Uh, Joel's. He was a friend of uh, Lloyd's and, and Andrew White. And so, you know, even though we didn't know him back in the day, I feel like he's a member of the New Thing family, man, because he's okay. so, so passionate about this thing. It's just, it's his energy. He is one of the, the beautiful, one of the most beautiful high energy people that I've met in a long time. You know, he's sincere and he's passionate and he has, you know, lent his spirit to this whole endeavor. And, it, and he's the person who is centrifugal to making this whole thing happen along with Joel. Oh, that's fantastic. So this is uh, <clears throat> at the AFI Silver Theater and this is uh, on February 9th. Right. The Friday mm-hmm. night that's at 7 mm-hmm. o'clock and you'll be screening the new thing uh, this little light of mine, and uh, then uh, a screening of DC Cab. And and you know, uh, Rusty, you asked, what am I doing in Boston? Well, on Monday, the 29th, I'm sending up a payload to the International Space Station, and what's in the payload it is a film mm-hmm. of children from around the world singing This Little Light of Mine. Awesome. And, it, and that's going to broadcast back to Earth uh, so you, you can see it. But it's, it's a film whose intention is to bring some positive energy, you know, to the planet, you know, and the title is very significant. It's a, and in, in, in the title you have the word light, and this, this film is intending to combat some of the darkness that we're experiencing around the world, the wars, you know, the division in the U S you know, and, and the, the, the film has children singing a song that has been buried in my heart and mind since my days as a field secretary in mm-hmm. Mississippi, when a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, oh, used to yes. sing that song. Yes. Yeah, she used Boy. to sing that song at the rallies and spirit us. And she, and she had been a, uh, a timekeeper on a uh, uh, plantation in, in, in Ruleville, and she joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating, Coordinating Committee, and she led the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, and, and, you know, she was a, she's a civil rights hero and a civil rights legend. Topper, she used to you know, just, that song just, at the rally. Well, just before I met you in, 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 in June of 1967, right after I graduated, I, I, I was in Ruleville, Mississippi. Ooh. We were knocking on doors still. Miss Hamer was still registering people in Sunflower County. Oh. And I just sitting in her living room listening to her talk about what, what was happening and, and oh. where things were going to go really changed oh, my do. life, you know? 
Yeah, you know you her, know, man. You know, just you having know. having having met her and uh, and then coming across the new thing as I became a Vista volunteer, <laughs> it's been huh. been putting my life together ever since. You know, <laughs> you know, and and in in, in concluding our interview, I'm going to play a, a, another artist that that played at the new thing. She's in ill health. Uh, my my friend Steve Novosel still oh. goes up to visit her. Uh, even though they've been divorced for 50 years, he still has that connection. Roberta Flack, and I've taken it back to first take and Donny Hathaway's song, Trying Times, to, uh, to to conclude our interview and what we've been talking about. Topper, I'm really looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks Likewise. At, Likewise. at the Silver Theater and at the, at the American University. All these connections coming back home. 